Deer hunting season 1985, childhood friends David Till and Brian Ogin joined the exodus upstate. A three and a half hour trip to a cabin owned by David Till's family in White Cloud, Michigan. The two men leave Friday evening. Monday morning dawns with no word from the hunters. An accident offers the most likely scenario. Steele alerts law enforcement to be on the lookout for the hunter's vehicle, a 1980 black Ford Bronco, and asks the media for help. By early December, several people claim to have seen their truck in the Mayo area, some 150 miles distant from their cabin. The woods of northern Michigan, however, offer no clue as to the whereabouts of the Bronco or the missing men. After the hunters have been in the woods, that they've not come across a vehicle, that they've not come across a weapon, anything that uh, would lead you to believe that they got lost or something happened that was accidental, um, then you're pretty sure that they met some type of foul play. In 1985, Philip Steele will work 14 missing persons cases. By year's end, only one sits unsolved. The fate of the missing hunters remains a mystery slipped into the cold files. Two years later, the hunters are still missing. Their truck, apparently swallowed whole by the Michigan woods. Their pictures still plastered in Mayo's local watering holes. Investigators finally get a break in the form of a confidential informant who overheard a conversation and wants to get it off his chest. Lloyd tells detectives he was at a birthday celebration with family and friends in a Michigan bar called O'Shea's. At the other end of the table, a family of seven known as the Duval brothers, also known as local bullies. Everybody was sitting around at the table drinking. A few of them was getting up back and forth dancing, and uh, they were talking to a brother-in-law and my father-in-law about, you know, fights that they had been in, things they were doing. They were laughing, you know, and having a good time. The Duvals begin talking about the beating they once gave two Michigan hunters. It begins with one of the brothers, J.R., getting beat up himself. I guess an altercation took place and they beat J.R. pretty good. And that he'd went home and told the other brothers what had happened. According to Lloyd, at least two of the brothers returned to the bar, took the hunters outside, and beat them to death. They made the remark, you should have seen the expression on one of them's face when we did the other one. And they had made the remark that they had fed them to the pigs. As Lloyd listens inside O'Shea's, the brothers describe how they took the hunters' bodies back to a local farm and into the pig pen. And they were laughing and joking about it. And I mean, when somebody makes a remark, yeah, we fed them to the pigs, you think, ah, you know, the guys are BSing, you know. Detective Kurt Schramm takes Lloyd's story seriously and begins to dig into the Duval brothers' background. He starts with the local pigs, huge animals more than capable of devouring a human. When we initially heard it, it was, uh, you know, that seems about as far-fetched as what it could be. But we, what we learned was is that uh, one of the brothers did have pigs or, or large hogs. And the information that we learned was that they were extremely mean and would eat anything. As for the brothers themselves, they are pretty mean too. All of them carry criminal convictions for either boosting cars, poaching deer, or assaulting women just enough violence to scare the locals into silence. Persistence, however, has its rewards. Over time, Schramm cultivates some contacts, people who are willing to risk the brothers' anger and begin to talk. For their part, the brothers are not happy. One of them phrased it as, as there was a snake in the woodpile, and they were concerned about who was talking. Unbeknownst to them is that they were the ones that were talking to other family members and friends, and you know, eventually it was getting back to us. The stories largely corroborate what Lloyd has already told police about a fight outside a bar, the hunters beaten to death, and then a ride out to the pig pen. The problem for Schramm? How does he prove it? None of his informants claim to have actually seen the beating. The Duvals are holding their peace, 
and pigs don't make very good witnesses. Without something more, the Michigan DA declines to press charges and the case goes cold. Bronco catches a whiff of rumor about a woman who might have been an eyewitness to the hunter's death. Bronco talks his way into the home of Barb Boudreau. The fear in her eyes is naked and palpable. The detective knows he has his first break in the case. She knew something, and uh, I just needed to establish a relationship with her, a rapport, some kind of a trust with her, to where I could get her to talk to me. Bronco meets with his witness over a period of months, months that eventually become years. Each time he draws out more of Barb's story. Barb tells Bronco she saw the hunters on the night they died. She and her friend Ronnie Emery, now deceased, were drinking at a bar called Linker's Lost Creek Lodge. The two hunters were standing at the bar. A pair of Duval brothers, J.R. and Coco, walked in and confronted the men. Barb knew the Duvals and knew there was going to be trouble. I says, if the Duval brothers are here and they zeroed in to these two deer hunters, there's going to be some ass kicking tonight. Barb and Ronnie pick up stakes and head out of the bar, back to Barb's house less than a half mile away. Outside her kitchen window, Barb hears men in the street and the makings of a fight. You could hear men cussing at each other, saying, you MF, and just bad language. And, and I says, Ronnie, they're fighting down here. So he says, well, let's go watch. Barb tells Bronco that Ronnie Emery headed down to the fight alone. A short time later, the yelling stopped. Then Ronnie returned. He came back and said, they're beating them. I think they killed them. I think they beat them to death. These guys are pleading for their lives. Barb said she could hear these pings, and it sounded like an aluminum bat hitting a softball. Barb's testimony is not the eyewitness account Bronco had hoped for, but it's close enough. Investigative subpoenas are issued, and Barb Boudreau is asked to repeat her story before a prosecutor from the Michigan Attorney General's office. Four years after they first met, Barb Boudreau and Detective Lesneski trade kitchen talk for an on-the-record deposition. Barb is nearing the end of her testimony when conscience takes hold and her story takes a twist. When I went to the attorney general, I was sworn to tell the truth, which I did, sort of, until near the end. And I said, you know, I can never tell you the whole truth. And they shut the tape down. And I looked at Bronco, and I said, you know I know. And she just blurted out that she saw it. She was there. She saw the whole thing. She was with Ronnie Emery. She witnessed the whole thing. And I mean, I suspected there was more, but I never thought it was that. Barb Brudreau explains that she watched from behind a tree as at least five men surrounded David Till and Brian Ogin. J.R. and Coco Duval beat the two hunters with baseball bats as the others looked on. Then she describes exactly how the missing hunters met their ends. David Till was on his knees. He had already been beat because he was pretty well bloody. And he had his hands up in the air and he goes, oh my God, somebody help us. And Coco swung the bat and said, you're a dead MFR. And his head popped like a pumpkin. It just sounded like you drop a pumpkin. And he was down. David Till lay dead in a snow-covered field. His companion, Brian Ogin, broke free and began to run for his life. They went after him and drug him back, and he's saying, you killed my friend, you killed my friend. And then they stood him up, and they said, look at that. He pissed himself. And then they threw him on the ground, proceeded to start kicking and beating him until there was no more noise. Barb runs from the scene, with Ronnie Emery hot on her heels. A short time later, the two hear a knock at the front door. It's the Duval brothers with simple instructions and a highly specific threat. It was Coco, JR, and said, you saw nothing, you heard nothing. We know you and your family, pigs have to eat too. She remembers that statement. And uh, I mean, and when she told me that, I just, I couldn't believe it. J.R. and Coco Duval are finally arrested for the murders of David Till and Brian Ogin. 
For 18 years, J.R. and Coco Duval cut figures that were larger than life, bragging freely in bars and restaurants of the time they murdered two hunters and the loathsome way they disposed of their bodies. On November 13th, the brothers are cut down to size, sent to jail for life without the possibility of parole. 